So to start off, uh, just a quick poll. How many of you guys use storage vMotion today? Okay, very good. How many of you guys use storage vMotion at least once a month? Okay, I'm impressed. That's awesome. How many of you guys have never had any storage performance problem? <laughs> you got the point. Storage performance problems are very, very common. The good news is you have come to the right session. Welcome to the session on storage DRS, which is a key new feature in vSphere 5.0. In this session, we will talk about what is storage DRS, what problem does it solve for you, how does it work, and most importantly, how can you take storage DRS and roll it out in your environment easily. My name is Manish Lohani, and I'm the product manager in vSphere product management team. And I will co-present this session today with Ann Holler, who is a senior staff engineer and a key person behind this feature. This is just a disclaimer slide that legal asked me to put in, so let's get that. This is the agenda for today. This is a slightly different order in which I told you guys. First, we will talk about the problem description, then we'll cover storage DRS high-level features and what it does, then I'll walk you guys through some key workflows to show you how easy it is to use, and then hand over to Anne, who's going to cover how the storage DRS works. She will give you some insights on the workings of the algorithm. And then we will cover some interoperability considerations with your existing products and arrays and other stuff that you're using in your environment. And then we'll conclude with some guidance on future work. To simplify logistics, we will take questions at the end. There are two mics here, uh, so folks who have questions, if you can come up and speak to us, uh, that would be excellent. We also have uh, Bala, who is a technical director in Storage DRS team, um, and we also should have Ajay somewhere here. Okay, Ajay is here. So we have two more key people in, from our team who are available here for questions. If you guys have any questions which we are not able to cover during the Q&A time, and we can cover that after the session. Okay, so let's look at the problem description. To kick off, what is the state of the art solution available today for managing storage resource problems? So VMware came out with DRS several years ago, and DRS provides automated management of memory and CPU resources by moving VMs around within the server uh, cluster. It worked very well in many, many environments, but it still had some problems. Because you were using shared storage, if you had some important VMs which were accessing the same storage which some less important VM also were accessing, you could run into situations where the less important VMs were hogging the bandwidth for storage I.O. and were starving your more important VMs. So VMware came up with VMware Storage I.O. Control in v, uh, vSphere 4.1 which solves this problem and provides proportional sharing of shared I.O. resources in a storage environment. In vSphere 5.0, we have added support for NFS to SIOC or storage I.O. control. There is a talk, um, this is the animation that I already talked about. There is a talk on storage I.O. control, uh, VSP1933. Uh, if you guys are interested, uh, Ajay is giving this talk later today. So you may want to attend that. Now, moving on to, OK, this was the key first step in solving storage resource management problems in data centers. Very, very important. It took us several years to develop this key technology. But this is not enough. There are some other key problems in data centers today in managing uh, your storage in virtual environments. Let's look at that through an example. So here is an IT admin. He is looking at a really large uh, uh, infrastructure. He has a lot of data stores. He has a really large server farm. He gets a request for provisioning a new VM. He has to select a server for his VM placement and also has to decide which VMDK should he place his, uh, which data store should he place his VMDK on. In this specific example, I have shown three data stores which have about equal utilization in terms of space. How does he decide which data store to pick my, uh, for my VMDK? 
one easy answer is he could look at space utilization and say they all look, they have space available. No data store has given me any problem in the last 90 days, so I'm just gonna pick one. I don't know. He picks the middle one. Unfortunately, he made a mistake. This was not the most optimal choice because the IT admin did not know the past history, the long enough past history of the data store, and also the future trends of not only space growth, but also IO load on the data store. So he provisions this VM, goes home, thinks everything is fine, and next morning when he comes in, he starts getting all these users who are getting performance problems on their applications calling him. He is stressed. What does he do now? He has to troubleshoot this problem on the fly with users on his head, and he doesn't know where to begin. It could be a compute problem, it could be a networking problem, or it could be a storage problem. So he says, let me quickly look at the compute side. It's easy. So he looks at some of the statistics and, you know, CPU utilization and everything. Doesn't find a thing. Because DRS was doing its job. So he looks at the network now. Looks at all the statistics, collects all that stuff and does some analysis and figures out there is no network bottleneck. Well, he kind of already knew that when he started. He knew that most likely it's gonna be a storage problem, but he was hoping to get lucky. Which in this case, he wasn't. Now he knows he has a storage problem. He knows his data store is overloaded. He looks at the stats, IOs look bad, there are long latencies, the data store is also running pretty full. What does he do? He does a storage vMotion to some other data store. But here's the problem. Which VMs and VMDKs should he move? And which destination data store should he choose? He has no idea. He can try to guess based on which other data store did not give him a problem in the last 90 days. But that's what he did when he chose the first data store. So how can he be sure? Well, he's, he's in a bad spot. The downside is, if he makes a mistake, he will not only will not fix the current problem, but will, may also affect some other applications which are running just fine right now. But he has to do something, so he does a storage motion of one VMDK. And he thinks that the problem came because of the last VMDK, that's what he's gonna move. In this specific case, he gets lucky, and the problem is fixed. But in real life, you don't know which VMDK to move. It's, not, it's never the last one which created the problem uh, is the definitely the right answer. So there are three lessons from this example. What are the three main problems? Virtual displacement of new VMs, out of space avoidance. If you're running out of data store, uh, space in a data store, how do you avoid that automatically? And then IO load balancing. These are the three key storage resource management problem that storage DRS is targeted to solve. Next, I'm going to talk about some storage DRS features at a high level to give you an idea of exactly how does storage DRS fix these problems. So storage DRS introduces this new object called data store cluster. It's a new management object available under data stores and data stores clusters view, just like host and host clusters. It's a storage equivalent of a DRS cluster. So data store cluster is to data store as host clusters is to host. It consists of similar data stores. What I mean by similar is it will, you cannot mix VMFS and NFS data stores into a same data store cluster. Also, we strongly recommend that you uh, group similar data stores in terms of uh, performance. For example, uh, they should be backed by spinning disk. I mean, it's not recommended to combine data stores which are backed by spinning disk with data stores that are SSD. And storage DRS cluster is a storage load balancing domain. What it means is uh, storage DRS will look at this cluster and it will make sure that the data store cluster is balanced in terms of IO load as well as uh, out of space avoidance. Here is the high-level architecture of how storage DRS works. Storage DRS works very, very similarly to DRS. It runs as a service under Virtual Center Server, and it has a bi-directional communication channel uh, to hosts. So DRS collects statistics from host related to CPU and memory, and uses those statistics with some configurations that users provide 
to make its, its decision. And then sends commands back to hosts to actually do vMotion to balance the cluster. Storage DRS works in the same way. It has a bidirectional communication channel to all the hosts that are connected to the member data stores of a data store cluster. It collects statistics related to space and I.O. load from all these hosts and aggregates them, and then uses the user-provided configuration settings to make it decisions and recommendations. Then it sends these commands back to hosts who perform storage vMotion operation. You guys must be wondering, so I already had host clusters. Now there is a new object called data store cluster. How are these two related, if at all? The answer is, the relationship is at two levels. At one level, you're looking at relationship between host cluster and data store cluster. And the relationship can be many to many. A single host cluster can be connected to multiple data store clusters. Similarly, a single data store cluster could be connected to multiple host clusters. We do not enforce any connectivity restri restrictions uh, between host clusters and data store clusters. The second level of connectivity is between hosts and mem member data stores of a data store cluster. Ideally, we strongly recommend you connect all the hosts within a cluster to all the data stores within a data store cluster. But this is not enforced by storage DRS. However, if you do not connect them fully, uh, IO load balancing feature is not available. So if you want to use IO load balancing, uh, you would have to connect all the hosts in a cluster to all the data stores in a data store cluster. Now let's look at some key capabilities of storage DRS using the example of the IT admin that I talked about earlier. If he had storage DRS, he would not face any of the problems that he faced. To start off, he had a really large environment. He had hundreds of data stores, and he had a lot of problem managing them. He could have just combined them into a data store cluster and started managing, instead of managing hundreds of data stores, he could have managed a few dozens or maybe a few data store clusters. Then when he got this request for a VM provisioning, he had to select which data store should I pick. If he had storage DRS, he would not have to make that decision. He would just say, okay, I have this data store cluster, which is my tier one or a tier two data store cluster, and point the VM uh, during the e VM provisioning flow to that data store cluster. Storage DRS will pick the right data store within the cluster, which is the best choice. Storage DRS will use both space availability as well as IO load considerations when it chooses the right cluster. Not only that, if you, if you only place your VM in the best possible way, that's not the end of the world. Workloads keep changing. You can still have overload conditions on data store. So Storage DRS monitors your data stores to see whether they are overloaded, both in terms of space usage or IO load. When it detects that, a data store is overloaded, it can take remediation action by moving VMDKs around to other data stores which are not overly loaded. So in the previous example, the IT admin, even if he had used storage DRS and placed his VM on a data store which was about to be full and something changed on the application side which resulted in a data store overload, storage DRS would have prevented any problem in terms of application performance would have moved the VMDK automatically or recommended to move a VMDK automatically to a different data store. Many, in many, many cases, you get VM requests where a VM has multiple VMDKs. And there are cases where you want VMDKs to be together. If you have an application that depends on availability of each VMDK equally, if either of them fails, application fails, then you would always want to place these two VMDKs together. Storage DRS allows you to do that. If you, if you tell Storage DRS these two VMDKs have intra-VMDK affinity, Storage DRS will always not only place them initially correctly together, but also move them together at all times. This is also the, this is also the default setting of Storage DRS. However, if you have an application where, let's say you have a database, and you want to keep the data disk separate from your log disk uh, for reasons where, you know, if something bad happens to the data store where I have my data disk, I still want logs to be able to recover my data. 
you can do that too. You just need to tell storage DRF that these two VMDKs have intra VMDK anti affinity rule. The storage DRF will make sure that they are always placed separately and always moved separate uh, to a separate data store subsequently. And finally, if you have applications like scale out stateless applications, which are um, which is also a high availability kind of architecture, where if one application goes down, you don't really care. There are other instances we will take care of that. Ideally, you would want to put them on independent hardware, so that if one instance goes down because of hardware failure, you still have other instances running. In DRS, we provided inter-VM anti-affinity rules for uh, placing them on different hosts. Storage DRS provides a similar uh, VM-to-VM anti-affinity rule for VMDKs. Combining these two rules, you can be sure that not only is your VM on separate hosts, but it, uh, the VMDKs are on separate data stores. So this example just shows uh, whatever I talked about. And let's say the IT admin has a SAN firmware upgrade coming up. There was this new VAI feature that uh, a SAN vendor implemented. And now he has to upgrade that. Before storage DRS, he would have to say, okay, I have to take this data store offline. I have to evacuate it manually and figure out where each of the VM and VMDKs go. With storage DRS, he doesn't need to worry about that. He can just put a data store in maintenance mode and let storage DRS take care of the rest. Storage DRS will not only evacuate the data store, but it will make sure that while doing so, the data store cluster is still balanced, both in terms of I.O. as well as the space. And the good thing is, while doing that, storage DRS will ensure that all the business rules, affinity and anti-affinity rules that you specified during VM creations are still obeyed. So you need not worry about those. Let's say you are running out of space or running out of I.O. in your data store cluster. And you have, you have found that you need to add more capacity to it. It's very, very simple. You just add a new data store to an existing data store cluster and you add capacity dynamically. When you do that, storage DRS will start considering this new data store for new VM provisioning as well as for load balancing if some other data stores are getting hot. So adding capacity to an existing data store cluster is super, super easy. Okay, now I'm going to walk you through a couple of workflows to show you how easy it is to use storage DRS. It is very, very well integrated in all the UI workflows of vCenter server, and it is super simple. You can go back and start using it if you have vSphere 5 in your environment as soon as you have it. So the first workflow is create a data store cluster. The data store cluster, as I said, is a man new management object. It's a child object of the data center object that you see in your vCenter server. So you just right click on it and say new data store cluster. And it will walk you through a few screens to configure um, to create a data store cluster. Note that you can turn on a storage DRS or not turn on storage DRS when you are creating a data store cluster. If you choose to not turn on storage DRS on a data store cluster, data store cluster becomes just a folder of data store. You still get aggregated events, statistics, and alarms, but you will not get any load balancing. The next step is to choose automation. Storage DRS is, uses manual mode by default, which is different than DRS. If you choose to run storage DRS in fully hands-off manner, you can do that. So, But if you want to have control over when those ac migrations actually happen in your environment, you can choose that time by putting storage DRS into manual mode, which gives you the most flexibility. This screen covers some of the key knobs that storage DRS provides you that you can use to control or influence its behavior. As you can see, by default, there is a checkbox which says enable IO metrics for storage DRS recommendations. By default, storage DRS will use both space as well as IO metrics for its recommendations for not only initial placement, but also ongoing migrations. However, you can choose to disable IO metrics if it doesn't make, to sen make sense to use it in your environment. 
In that case, storage GRS will only use space metrics. Note that when you use IO metrics, storage DRS automatically enables storage IO control in each of those data stores by default. Storage DRS and SIOC are complementary technologies. Storage DRS helps you avoid congestion situations by balancing load on a data store cluster. Whereas, if you do run into a congestion situation because eventually you will run out of capacity and you will get into those load conditions, and storage DRS will not be able to avoid that anymore, storage IO control will ensure that your high-priority VMs are still getting the right resources, even in a congestion situation. So storage DRS and SIOC are complementary technologies that are used together. As you can see in red here, there are two key thresholds that storage DRS uses. The first is utilized space. By default, it is set to 80%. What this means is, first of all, this is a global setting that applies to all the member data stores of the data store cluster. This utilization threshold means that as long as space utilization within a data store is less than this threshold, storage DRS will not migrate anything around. So if you set it to 80% and your data store is less than 80% utilized, storage DRS will not do anything. Everything is fine. But if it hits 80% threshold, storage DRS will start evaluating migration possibilities to bring that threshold below 80%. I said it will start evaluating and it will not move because it will also look at the imbalance in the cluster. If you have a cluster which is like fully loaded and there is no space to move, storage DRS will not move from one data store which is 85% utilized to another data store which is 83% utilized. So the difference between utilization in the source and the destination data stores in both I.O. and space should be significant enough for a storage DRS to migrate VMs or VMDKs. And Anne is going to talk more about it when she covers um, insights on how the algorithm works. The I.O. latency is set to 15 milliseconds by default. What I.O. latency threshold means is, again, this is a global setting for all data stores within the cluster. What this means is, if over a 24-hour period, latency of a data store is less than 15 milliseconds most of the time, and I will define what most is, storage DRS will not do anything. If, however, the latency of a data store goes above 15 milliseconds for at least some time, then storage DRS will start considering moves of that data store to different data stores within the cluster. And that sometime is about two hours in 24 hours. So it looks at the I.O. load. If the I.O. load goes up for a short peak, that doesn't matter. It looks at it cumulatively. If there is enough evidence that your data store is under I.O. load, only then will storage DRS consider migrating VMDKs off it. Okay, this screen just shows uh, the next step, which is you select the member data stores. Selecting member data stores is a two-step process. First, you select your hosts and clusters, and then using that list of hosts and clusters, storage, this uh, wizard will show you the filtered down list of data stores that are available. And you can, uh, you can filter this down in many ways. You have this uh, show data store connected to all hosts, or you can uh, also show a list of con data stores that are uh, partially connected. And you can also use some user-defined filters to filter this down, list down if you want to. So, in summary, there are four steps to create a data store cluster. You give it a name. You choose to decide whether I want to enable storage DRS or not. Select the automation level. Select those two thresholds, space utilization, IO utilization. Decide whether you want to enable IO metrics or not. And then finally, Choose the member data stores of a data store cluster. That's it. You have a data store cluster now. And if you have um, maintenance coming up for a SAN firmware upgrade or something else where you need to take a data store offline, you can just use this. This example shows prod cluster has two data stores, prod one and prod two, and there are four VMs running in prod one. And I just right click on that prod one and say enter SDRS maintenance mode. And this page shows all the recommendations that storage DRS gives you to evacuate the data store. Note that this is running in uh, manual mode. That's why storage DRS provides these recommendations. Otherwise, it would have automatically executed them. 
And at this point of time, I will hand it off to Anne, who will walk you guys through this workflow on creating a virtual machine. This is also the perfect segue on giving you insights on how storage DRS works under the cover. So handing off to Anne. Thanks, Manish. OK, um, quick poll. This is my signal for making a poll. This is my politician signal. Um, how many of you, and I'm betting on this poll because this is Las Vegas, how many of you, uh, I'm betting that a majority of you will say yes, how many of you do not enjoy the task or chore of placing virtual disks on a data store in your environment? Raise your hand. OK. Uh, OK, maybe that's a little less than half, one, two, infinity kind of thing. But, um, or maybe you have someone else who does it for you, kind of like the chore of mowing the lawn is not that important to me because my husband does it for me, but it's a chore. And placing a virtual disk on a data store is a chore because you need to think about the quality of the data store that's appropriate for the virtual disk. You need to think about the space available on all the virtual disk, on all the data stores that meet that quality, both now and considering the space growth. You need to think about the I.O. load on all of the data stores of that quality, both now and over time, because maybe right now you're not running backup, but when backup runs, things go to heck in a handbasket. And finally, you need to think about the rules, the business rules and organizational rules you have for placing the MDKs. And storage DRS placement is intended to offload this chore. It's very easy to use storage DRS to place VMs during VM creation. And you can also similarly place VM decays during cloning, relocating, or adding a disk to an existing virtual machine. In the workflow that you're familiar with for creating a virtual machine, at the point where you choose storage for that virtual machine, you can choose a data store cluster. And in particular, you can specify a profile, and you see the green arrow pointing at the profile, so this is the quality of data store cluster that you would like to choose. In this particular case, the user wanted a gold profile data store cluster, and the user is presented with a data store cluster that meets that profile. So let's see what happens when the user asks for the virtual disk to be placed in the data store cluster. Skipping ahead to the last part of the Create VM workflow, where you're getting the summary information about your VM, we see that Storage DRS has chosen a data store from the data store cluster, and that's what the green arrow is pointing at. The data store it chose was Prod1. This is its top choice within the data store cluster. This is a simple example where the VM only had one virtual disk. But Storage DRS can also handle placement if the VM had multiple virtual disks. And in particular, you can specify a data store cluster for each virtual disk, so that if the virtual disks that comprise your VM have different quality um, requirements, Storage DRS can handle that placement in different data store clusters if that is what you want. At this point, you can just accept the top recommendations by Storage DRS, or you can choose, and the person here chose, Show me all the storage recommendations that Storage DRS made for the virtual disk placement in this case. So if we do that, we see all the recommendations that Storage DRS produced for this um, data store placement within the data store cluster. And now you have the option of not choosing the top ranked one for Storage DRS, but choosing a somewhat lower ranked one because you have information maybe that Storage DRS does not have. In this particular example, this person knew that Prod1 was not the best choice because in a few days they were planning to take Prod1 down. So they would like to take another choice that Storage DRS presented them with, which was Prod2. So um, it's, this Prod2 still was acceptable to Storage DRS, still met all the goals and constraints that are appropriate for this placement, but the person had the choice of choosing not the top one. And one other thing I should say at this point if there was no data store in the data store cluster with adequate space to hold this disk that we want to place, Storage DRS would make recommendations to move other disks in order to make room to place this disk. And those would be prerequisite recommendations to allow this placement to take place. Now, some of you at this point may be wondering, hmm, 
what is the relationship between storage DRS selecting a data store for a virtual disk placement and server DRS selecting a host for a virtual disk to power on? Let's talk about that relationship, and let's talk about how storage DRS facilitates that relationship. The interaction occurs if you have a data store cluster and a server cluster that are not fully connected. And as Manish already said, we do not recommend that uh, situation. It's not ideal. But if you do have that situation, we uh, try to do the best we can to help you out. And so what happens in that case, what the relationship is, is when server DRS or when storage DRS chooses a placement of a virtual disk onto a data store in a data store cluster, this restricts server DRS to only power on that VM on hosts that can see the data stores that comprise the VMDKs that hold, that are for that virtual machine. Similarly, if server DRS powers on a host, powers on a VM on a host in a server cluster, then subsequently storage DRS is restricted to only move the disks that belong to that VM to other data stores that that host can see. So what to do in this non-fully connected world that you might have? The most high leverage point to do something smart is to choose both the host and the data store at provisioning time, because that allows the most flexibility downstream. And that's what storage DRS does. So if you are creating a virtual machine and you want storage DRS to place your virtual disks, and you want the host chosen from a server cluster, storage DRS does co-placement of the host and the data store for you. What it does is not only consider the space and I.O. resources, which it would normally consider to choose a data store within a data store cluster, but also the amount of available CPU and memory with respect to that data store. And using those four metrics and weighting them with any metric that's currently oversubscribed, weighted more highly, it makes those two choices for you. Let's look at an example. Here we see a data store cluster comprised of three data stores and a host cluster, a server cluster, is comprised of three hosts. And the user has asked to place a virtual disk in the data store cluster and has asked that some host from the server cluster be chosen. Here's a table of what storage DRS is presented with. The rows in this table correspond to the data stores in the data store cluster. For each of the data stores, we see a column for each of the four metrics that storage DRS is going to consider to make this co-placement. Space, I.O., available CPU, and available memory. If an entry in the table says low, that means there's not much of that resource remaining. If an entry in the table says high, that means there's a lot of that resource remaining. Medium is somewhere in between. If we look at data store one, it would be a great choice for placing the disk if we were only considering space and I.O., which would be the normal practice. But in this non-fully connected world that this person has, CPU and memory are poor, so there's very little availability on data store one of CPU and memory. So that's not a good choice when you're considering those two metrics. Data store two, on the other hand, is better availability on CPU and memory, but is uh, close to being out of space. And so again, that is not a good choice. Maybe a little better than choice one, but not ideal. The best choice of the three is data store three, where no resource is low and three of the resources are high. And so this is what storage DS will recommend. It will re recommend placement of the disk on data store three and for that placement, it will recommend registering the VM on host two, which has got the most resources available with respect to data store three. So that's it for placement. Let's go through a final workflow concerning defining rules. And Manish already talked about the three kinds of rules that storage DRS supports. Intro VM affinity, 
intra-VM anti-affinity, and inter-VM anti-affinity. We'll go through a workflow for the final kind of rule. So for inter-VM anti-affinity, the idea is that you want to keep the, v the virtual disks for the specified VMs on separate data stores, probably for availability. The menu on the left-hand side should look familiar to those of you who use server DRS. This is the menu you pull down to change the configurations of your current of your cluster. And in this case, the person has, suggest, has selected rules. They want to change the rules. And they've selected that they want to create a VM-to-VM anti-affinity rule. Here, the user is presented with the VMs from which he can select the ones that he wants to be separated. Now, quick poll. How many of you remember the bad old days of server DRS when we would only let you select two VMs? OK, yeah. All right, sorry about that. We fixed that in server DRS, and we never put you through that for storage DRS. You could pick any number of VMs that you would like separated. However, if you don't have enough data stores to actually accomplish satisfying that rule, you will get a fault from storage DRS. Here we see a recommendation because at the time the person defined this rule, there was a violation of the rule in the data store cluster. So here we see a recommendation to correct that violation. And we also see, it's going off a little bit on the side of the page, the expected space and IO impact of accepting that recommendation. You want to correct violations, but you guys told us you'd like to know more about recommendations in general when they're given to you uh, by DRS. And so we, did, we responded to that. So that's it for the four workflows. Now let's look under the covers at what storage DRS does uh, periodically or when there is an issue in the cluster with respect to actually addressing avoiding out of space and balancing load. Storage DRS runs to do these two things, either periodically in the background when there's a significant change in the cluster, like when you add a data store to the cluster or define a rule, like we just did, or when an, any data store in the data store cluster crosses the space utilization threshold, they're constantly being monitored. And finally, when you push that button that says run storage DRS that you see in the upper left hand, uh, right hand corner of the slide. Now I'm going to talk about out of space avoidance and I.O. load balancing separately because the algorithms are, it's, ir, it's clear to talk about the algorithms separately, but the algorithms don't run in isolation. They run in tandem. And what I mean by that is we're not, the algorithm is not going to make a recommendation to fix a load problem that will cause a space problem. So it's going to look, each of the attributes are going to look at the other side to make a good recommendation that respects the constraints of the other side and fixes the problem of the one side. Let's start with space. Because if a virtual disk can't get the space it needs, it's game over for the virtual disk, and it's a very bad day for the vSphere administrator. As I said, storage DRS is constantly monitoring the space usage on the data stores. And when a data store in the data store cluster crosses the space utilization, it runs looking for moves to correct that problem. It eliminates any moves it considers to be of marginal value. Manish already mentioned this, but to be more specific, there's a, um, a user configurable difference between the source data store utilization and the target data store utilization that's used to characterize a move as being marginal. And the default value there is 5%. So if one data store is 82% utilized and another is 78, storage DRS is not going to make that move. For non-marginal moves, storage DRS looks at both the current space utilization and, given the history of space growth on each data store, it looks at the future space utilization, projecting that growth out for 30 hours by default. As well as looking at space, and of course I.O. load, as I already mentioned, it also looks at the cost of the storage vMotion that would be recommended. It prefers cheaper storage vMotions. What do I mean by cheaper? If the storage vMotion is for a powered on VM, we want a, a storage vMotion that has lower overhead in terms of mirrored writes. And for either powered on or off VMs, we want a storage vMotion 
that moves the smallest disk that will help us with the almost out of space problem. Let's look at an example. Here we have a data store cluster that consists of three data stores. They're shown at the bottom of the page. Right above each data store is a utilization graph where time is on the x-axis, so the beginning of time is now, and time is moving forward. The y-axis is utilization, and so the capacity of the data store shown in green is 100% utilization. And so we can see where the data store is now for utilization, and we can see the projection over time, and we see that data store three is highly utilized. It's above the space threshold, so what to do? If we look at the two remaining data stores, data store one looks good from the standpoint of it has the lowest current utilization, but it has a very high growth rate. So because it has a high growth rate, uh, it is not a good choice if we look out 30 hours. Data store two, on the other hand, has a somewhat higher current utilization, but if we look out 30 hours, it has a much lower growth rate. So it is the better choice of the two, and storage DRS will make that choice and make that recommendation. So it moves the virtual machine disk from data store three to data store two, and then we see the resulting situation in this data store cluster after that move takes place. At this point, we've completed the discussion of out of space avoidance. Let's move on to talk about IO load balancing. And I guess Manish already, I was gonna do one of these polls, but Manish already did this poll. Let's just see how many people have either had an IO problem in terms of IO load on your data stores. Okay, cool. And how many people spend way more time than you'd like ensuring that that doesn't happen? Okay, so storage DRS is intended to reduce the risk of the IO load going too high on your data stores and also reduce your personal load in managing that risk. Let's talk about the concept behind how storage DRS handles I.O. load by working through an example by hand. On this slide, we see the representation of two data stores, one on the left-hand side of the slide and one on the right-hand side of the slide. And that representation is in the form of a performance graph, two performance graphs for each. On both graphs, load is on the x-axis. In the top graph, Latency is on the y-axis. And as you would expect, as load goes up, latency goes up linearly. In the bottom graph for each data store, you see load mapped against throughput. Here, as load goes up, throughput also goes up, but not linearly. And at some point, the device becomes saturated and it flattens out and even maybe drops a little bit. And in this case, you can see that data store one is more heavily loaded than data store two. So the question is, what would happen if a VM running on data store one was moved to a VM, it moved to be, moved, it's just, its virtual disk was moved to data store two? Okay. Seems kind of straightforward. The latency on data store one would go down, the latency on data store two would go up the throughput on data store one would go down, the throughput on data store two would go up. But this particular example is very interesting in that regard. In this particular example, data store two is more powerful. That is, as load goes up, its latency slope is flatter. It's a more powerful data store. So here, not only do we reduce the maximum latency in this two host, two data store, data store cluster by moving the load, but we actually get a lower average latency because the latency induced on data store one in the addition is lower than the latency lost, that latency reduced, uh, is lower than the latency reduced on data store one. Also, data store two is in a nicer part of the throughput curve. So as we add work to data store two, we get more benefit in the throughput sense then we lost in data store one, which is in a flatter part of the throughput curve because it was busier. So in summary, average latency was lower when we made the move, and overall throughput is similar, could be in, in, this, in this particular case is lower. 
So this is what storage DRS does, but it doesn't have the benefit of being given these graphs for the two data stores and being given some information about the virtual disk load. It needs to build a model online of the way the data stores behave, and it needs to build a model of what the virtual disks do. And then, using the model it's built, it needs to do what we just did. Storage DRS builds the model for each data store in the data store cluster by collecting points that map below to latency and doing a linear fit of those points. Then it knows the slope and intercept for the latency on that data store. Similarly, Storage DRS monitors the virtual disk load over time for the virtual disks that are on powered on VMs running on the data stores in the data store cluster. And it looks at a non-trivial amount of time, so it makes sure it really understands the load. So at least 16 hours of time by default are required to establish that it understands the load. And using those models, it does exactly what we did on the previous slide, which is project the impact of moving the workload of a particular virtual disk from one data store to another. This is a pretty simple explanation of what storage DRS does. There's many more details in the two um, references on this slide, so I invite you to check out those references if you want to dive deeper into what storage DRS does. Let's look at a brief example. Here we have a data store cluster consisting of three data stores. The data store on the left is below the latency threshold, and the two data stores on the right are above the latency threshold. And the overall average latency in the data store cluster is above the 15%, 15 milliseconds um, uh, threshold for high load. So the load currently is, average latency is above um, 17 milliseconds, and we're getting about 4,200 IOPS. IOPS is a measure of throughput. Storage DRS builds a model of these three data stores, and it monitors the virtual disk workloads over time. And it decides to move two of the disks from the far right data store and one of the disks from the middle data store to the far left data store because that data store can handle that load. It has spare capacity in terms of latency, and it's in a flatter part of the latency curve. And a flatter part of the throughput curve. So the result is that uh, we get this configuration of disks laid out on the data stores. We get a reduction of latency in all three data stores to be below the 50 millisecond threshold. We get an average reduction over the latency, average over the whole data store cluster of 11%. And we get a 35% uh, in increase in throughput, reduction in increase in throughput because we were in a nicer part of the throughput curve with respect to data store one. So we've talked here about latency, and we've talked here about IOPS. And those are important things to monitor on the data store. Storage DRS monitors them, and we wanted to help you monitor them as well. So in association with this feature in vSphere 5, we also added new performance graphs to help you give you better visibility into these metrics. It's a little bit hard to see, but the uh, arrow on the left is pointing at a graph of normalized latency per data store, and right below that is read latency per virtual disk. So you can get a sense of what the workload's um, latency characteristics are with respect to the data stores and what the data store's latency characteristics are. On the right-hand side, you see a load measure. This is aggregated IOPS per data store. Again, you can look at how much load is running on your data stores. So we think we enjoyed using these graphs during our development, and we think they will bring a lot of value to you as well. So this concludes the part of the talk talking about the algorithm. Let's wrap up with interoperability of this feature with other things that you may be doing in your vSphere um, environment. I'll present the interoperability in three slides. In each slide, there'll be a left-hand column which mentions the feature or product. In the middle column, it'll indicate whether that feature or product is recommended for storage v DRS initial placement recommendations. And in the final column, it will indicate whether that feature or product is supported with respect to migration recommendations from storage DRS. On this first slide, we see that storage DRS is compatible 
fully compatible for both placement and migration with snapshots, SRM, NFS, and RDM pointer files. Storage DRS is not supported for pre vSphere 5 hosts. And in this release, it's not supported for linked clones. In the next two slides, let's look at how storage DRS interoperates with various array features you may have. If you are using array-based replication, storage DRS is supported for placement. But for migration, we recommend that you put it in manual mode. Of course, manual mode is the default. So that you can evaluate um, the impact on protection and on the size of the next replication um, before deciding or deciding when to apply the recommendation. Similarly, for array-based snapshots or array-based dedupe, the feature is supported for placement. But again, we recommend that you have migration recommendations in manual mode so that you can decide uh, to apply them uh, given their potential impact on space usage. And finally, with respect to arrays that are thin provisioned, the feature is supported for placement. For migration, it is only supported if you were using a VASA um, compliant array. VASA arrays, uh, VMware APIs for storage awareness, uh, report an alarm if the backing store of the thin provisioned array is running low on space. Final slide on interop. And this slide has to do with interop if your array is doing things related to load balancing. If your array is doing things related to load balancing, we say let it do that. We say disable I the I.O. load balancing in storage DRS. And you saw that in Manisha's slide how to do that. You still get a complementary set of features around space-based placement and management of out-of-space avoidance, maintenance mode, and adherence to your business rules. And you let the array handle the load balancing that it's designed to handle. So in summary, run on, coming here in the end, we've shown you that storage DRS eases your burden of storage placement eases your burden managing out of space avoidance and load, allows you to do data store maintenance mode, and adheres to your business rules. And if your arrays are smart arrays that are doing load balancing, it complements those arrays by handling space, business rules, and maintenance mode. We are excited about this feature, um, and we've been working on it many man years, and we're looking forward to you using it. Uh, and uh, we want to hear your feedback. There's some areas of future work which we'd like you to help prioritize. So if you get a chance to put your thoughts about these features on the feedback forms, um, space quotas to control space growth, I.O. reservations to ensure an SLA for disks, resource pools for those of you who use server DRS and know about delegation for resource pools, and also more placement controls if our choices between consolidation and balance aren't appropriate for you. In summary, people say what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Let's make that true maybe of the VMware party, but let's not make that true of storage DRS. Try it while you're here in the hands-on lab and enable it back in home when you get back to the office. And thanks, and we're ready to take questions. Or you can catch us out in the lobby if, you don't, if we don't have any time for questions at this point. Thank you.